Hello, welcome to the FinCor family. Here at FinCor, we specialize in meeting all of your I'm so done needs. Now our methods may seem a little drastic for some people, and the results may not seem like the ideal solution. But here at FinCor, finishing every project to meet your I'm so done needs is our highest priority. Right or wrong, we get it done. Now let's hear from one of our current customers. This break at homework is so hard. What is this? I'm only six. I'm so done with homework. Go time. Thank you for using Fincor. We are glad that we could help you resolve your homework issue. You didn't do anything. All you did was tear up my pre cal homework that I needed to turn in tomorrow. Here, kid. Color something pretty your mom will put on the refrigerator. But that's not how it works. I need it. I need it. You're welcome. All right, hey, welcome to Parkway Fellowship today, and I also want to give a, a special shout out to those watching us online, and I also want to, I want to give a special shout out to Isabella, who watches us from college every single week. So Isabella, thanks for watching, and uh, keep studying hard, even when you get to the point where you're like, I'm just so done with school, okay? Yeah. We <laughs> oui, oui, we have a delivery. Oh, for the love. I surrender! <laughs> All right, eventually you'll get it. Yes, we are, we are from Le Friend. We are from the door almost opened on the wrong time. <laughs> we are from Le Friend Corps. When we hear I'm so done, we get on the run. <laughs> now, give me your King Louis. <laughs> okay. There you go. All right. Thanks, French Fry. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. We'll get to the box here in just a little bit. Um, but listen, let me ask you this. Have you ever set your hopes on something only to be disappointed when it didn't work out? Have you ever actually had a whole series of disappointments where multiple things didn't work out? Well, today, Jesus is going to show us how he can take our disappointments and turn them into a trophy. So let me start out by telling you about the greatest disappointment I have ever experienced in my whole life. Um, I moved here straight from seminary. I, that's when I moved to Katy, and I uh, took a job as an associate pastor at a local church. I actually held two different positions there, and I was there for seven years. And, and I loved that church, and I loved the families in that church, and, and I served them with all my heart. And honestly, I really grew to love these people so, so much. In fact, I'm still friends with a ton of them. Um, and the senior pastor who asked me to come on staff was actually my senior pastor growing up in San Antonio as a kid. So like I'd known him for years and years and years. And when he brought me on staff, he told me that his personal desire was that 
when he retired, that I would succeed him as the senior pastor of the church. And then over the years, he actually kind of floated that idea out to multiple people, and everybody actually seemed like, you know, really good with it. Well, in the middle of year six, the adult son of my senior pastor became terminally ill. It was so unexpected and so tragic. And so my senior pastor took early retirement so he could be with his son during the last year of his life. I mean, I'm telling you, like our hearts were breaking for him and his entire family. Well, a few months after that, um, one of the guys who was leading the search for the, uh, the, you know, the new senior pastor called me and made an appointment to come see me in my, in my office. Okay, like, you know what I'm thinking, right? Yeah, I'm thinking, all right, baby, like, I'm going to get to shoot my shot. Like, this is something I've been preparing for, have been praying for, have been excited about for, you know, several years, and so now the guy who's in charge of the search is going to come see me to come talk to me, and like, I'm thinking this might be it. And so I'm I'm super, super geeked and super excited. So the guy comes, and he sits down, and uh, he says, Mike, look, I'm just going to make this quick. I'm like, okay. He says, man, I'm telling you what, we, we, we really like you. Like, we really, really do. And by the way, you have been great here. But, but, we don't think you have what it takes to be a senior pastor. And you're going to come up a little short on the experience side of things. And so really, there's no need for you even to apply. And then he got up and walked out. Now, now to, to be fair, to be fair, the guy, he was actually very kind. He, very not, like he wasn't a jerk about it at all. But I'm telling you, I was crushed. Like, my heart was broken. I, I had never been so disappointed in my entire life. And that night, um, I had my accountability group meeting. I, I had two guys that I met with, you know, pretty much every week, to, you know, for accountability. And our meeting just happened to be that night. And so when I went that night, I went and and I just cried. Not like shed a tear. I mean, I sobbed. I mean, I was like heaving sobs for over an hour. And these guys were amazing. And look, they, they knew what happened. And um, they just sat with me. Like they didn't, say, they didn't say a thing. I didn't actually need them to say anything. I just, I just needed them to be there. Um, and I'll never forget their support. But I, I'm telling you, I've never felt disappointment like that in my entire life. I, like, I had known this senior pastor since I was in seventh grade. We, we were really good personal friends. In fact, we still are. Um, and I had studied, I had prayed, I had prepared, I had apprenticed, I had practiced, preached a ton to do everything. I had done everything I could to prepare myself for that kind of a role that wasn't going to happen. Now, I also knew that God had called me to be a senior pastor at some point, and since it wasn't going to happen at that church, I now also knew that I was going to have to leave that church. And at least half of my tears were because I knew I was going to have to leave a lot of these families and their kids whom I had grown to deeply love. I'm telling you, like, my heart was breaking with disappointment. It was terrible. You ever been in a situation like that? I mean, not, not that you're like, oh, I'm not going to be the senior pastor of, not, not that. But you, have you ever been so disappointed with something that didn't happen or wasn't going to work out? Ever... Ever face something like that? Maybe it was a position at work. Maybe it's a promotion that you know you deserve, but, you know, it went to someone else. Maybe it was an award that you should have gotten, but didn't, and somebody else got it. 
Maybe it's something closer to home, like a broken relationship or a broken engagement. Or when you realize your marriage was over. Or maybe it was yet another negative pregnancy test. Or maybe an adoption that didn't work out. Or a foster to adopt that didn't work out. Or maybe, maybe your teenage kids or maybe your adult kids aren't turning out like you had hoped and prayed and you just feel powerless to help them. Well, what, what do we do when we face disappointment like that? Like, where do we turn? Too many people turn to a bottle or to a drug or to someone outside their marriage. Some people just bury themselves at work. Other people, they just put on a happy face, just pretend like nothing's ever, ever wrong. Other people just become so angry that they end up lashing out at people that they actually do love and are close to. Um, regardless, like, what do we do when we face disappointments of such magnitude that, like, literally, we're just dying inside? Well, that's why I am so thankful for one particular miracle in the Bible. Because there was a person who had experienced disappointment that didn't last just for a couple of months. It had lasted more than three decades. More than three decades. I, I can't imagine how disillusioned this guy had become with life, with family, and honestly with God. So ultimately, what Jesus actually does for this person is exactly what he wants to do with each one of us when we get to the point in our lives where, where we say, I'm just so done with disappointment. Now, before we get to the scriptures, let me give you a little bit of background so that what we read is going to make sense, okay? There was a man-made pool in the heart of the city of Jerusalem, and it's called the Pool of Bethesda, okay? It's called the Pool of Bethesda. Um, now, legend had it that occasionally an angel would come and stir the waters of the pool, and the first person that was able to jump into the water would be healed of whatever it is that ailed them. Now, here's the thing. There's no historical evidence that that actually ever happened. But it's what people believed. And so, um, as, as, we can, as you imagine, the pool or the area around the pool had become a, a throng of people with various ailments all wanting to be the first to get in the water if it ever was disturbed. And so here's what happens. It's all written in John chapter 5, beginning of verse 1. So get your Bible out or your app out or your notes out or you can follow on the screen, whatever works best for you. Um, chapter 5, beginning of verse 1, it says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. What? I mean, isn't that incredible? Now, here's the great thing. Here's what I've always wondered. Like, why didn't the guy just, you know, lie on the very edge of the pool? And then as soon as, you know, looking at the water, as soon as the water was sort of like, just roll off. Like just, you know, flop into the pool. I mean, you're going to be first at that point, right? Like why, why didn't that happen? Well, I've actually been 
to the pools of Bethesda in Jerusalem. Now, they're, they're not active pools any longer. They're just ruins. In fact, here's a picture of one of the pools. Um, again, this is just one of the pools, and, but there are several. They all look about the same. And you can see, like, there's no like ledge down where the water would be it's all really high up so it would have been like a 20 foot flop into the water so you can see why that like that wasn't going to work and he needed someone to carry him down the stairs to get into the water okay well so that wasn't going to work so then the real question is like well why didn't why didn't his family help him I mean, why didn't his parents or like a couple of uncles or a couple of cousins just maybe camp out there you know, at the pools with him, and the water started to like, rush him and get him down into the water. You know, that way they could, he, they, he could beat everybody else. I, we don't know. I mean, maybe the guy didn't have any family. Maybe his family didn't want to have anything to do with him. Maybe they actually tried that a few times, and it just, you know, for whatever reason, didn't work. We don't know. But regardless, what we do know is his family was not there to help him. So for 38 years, he has sat on the side of this pool, living the life of a beggar, begging God to help him or to somehow help him get in the pool first. Listen, 38 years, every summer, every winter, every day, every night, lying on a mat beside the pool. I mean, listen, can you imagine the amount of disappointment this guy had with God? with his family, with just life. I think about us. Like I, I, I wonder how many of us have ever felt like this guy. I wonder how many of us have just felt disappointment with God, with family, with just life, and maybe even rightfully so. And You know, whether our disappointment has lasted 38 hours or 38 years or, you know, somewhere in between, through the example of this guy, like, what is Jesus saying to us? What what does Jesus want me to do when I'm just so done with disappointment? Well, there's three things. Here's the first. I want you to write it down. Number one is this. I need to take it to Jesus first. I need to take it to Jesus first. Listen, for this guy, like family wasn't there, friends weren't there, no one was there to help him. Look, even the local legend wasn't any help. But Jesus was. And in the end, Jesus was the only one who could help him, and Jesus was the only one he needed. Now look, I do know that he couldn't have gone to Jesus first because when this guy first became sick, Jesus wasn't even born. You know, when, when this happened, Jesus was only 32 years old or thereabouts. So I, I realized he couldn't have gone to Jesus like at the very beginning. But here's the deal. When Jesus is the only solution, why not go to him first? Why not? If you can. And by the way, all of us can. Like we, we can. Now, practically speaking, what does that look like? Well, it looks exactly like what I did that night. I went to my accountability group with my guys. Listen, I wasn't sobbing in front of them. I was sobbing in front of the Lord. They just happened to be there to support me. But I wasn't crying to them. I mean, I, I was crying to God. I was pouring my heart out to God. That's what I was doing. Nelson, I'm not saying that when you face disappointment, you've got to actually go to Jesus and cry. I'm I'm not saying you have to do that. But what I am saying is that you go to him in prayer and you tell him how you actually feel. Like you don't have to put on a front or pretend like things are better than they really are. Just tell him how you really feel. Listen, and if they're tears, they're tears. And if there's not, then there's not. It doesn't matter. But you go to Jesus first. You go to Jesus before you go to your best friend or your accountability group or the ladies in your book club or you know or whatever else. You go to Jesus first. Because listen, like just like this guy, Jesus is the only one who can fix it. Nobody else can. Now they can sit with you, and that's important. 
But listen, learn from this guy. Go to Jesus first. But that's only the first lesson. Here's the second. Write this one down. I need to remember that his solution is usually different than my expectation. His solution is usually different than my expectation. I mean, think about it. Like, what was this guy's expectation? What do you think was going to happen? Like, he thought that Jesus was going to help him get into the pool first. Like, that's what he thought was going to happen. And he's like, Jesus, I'll have everybody help me get in the pool. Kind of like, so you're going to help me, right? I mean, that, that was essentially what his expectation was. He thought that's how he was going to get healed. But is that how it happened? Nope. Jesus had a way different solution. Now, see, I think for us, sometimes we expect God to answer our prayers one way, don't we? But what if he wants to answer them a different way? Can he do that? Yes. Of course he can. Absolutely. And, we, and, by the way, would you be okay with that? Yeah, of course you would. Yeah, I, I think we all would. But, see, the problem, the problem is, is when things in life don't unfold the way we expect and how we're praying for, that begins to feed into our disappointment. That's what happens. And so when God doesn't answer our prayers the way we expect, listen, it either leads to disappointment or it feeds the disappointment we already have. But listen, does God have the freedom to answer our prayers any way he wants to? Well, of course he does. So listen, can, can we make room in our minds that his solution might be different than our expectations? we got to make room for that. So listen, so when you are facing disappointment, remember this guy at the pool of Bethesda. Remember that when God answered his prayer, he answered it in a way that he did not expect. He, he, there's no way he could have even seen it coming. And, when, and listen, and when you feel disappointment creeping in, or maybe there's already disappointment uh, and you're already wrestling with it, remember, God's solution is probably different than what your expectations are. And here's the thing. God's solution is always better. It's always better. I mean, we're still talking about this guy 2,000 years later because of what God did in his life. So make room in your heart that God's solution might be different than your expectation. In fact, it, it, it probably will be. <laughs> okay, here's the third lesson. And this was actually my favorite. Now, I want to explain this one a little bit before I actually give you the point. And to do that... We need to see what is in our box for this week. So, yeah, it's a mat. A lot like the mat the guy probably had at the edge of the pool of Bethesda. Um, and after Jesus healed him, what did Jesus tell the guy to do with the mat? I mean, did, he, did, he, did, he, did, did Jesus say, hey, pick up your mat and go throw it in the trash. You don't need it anymore. Or did he say, hey, pick up your mat and burn it because that does, that's not a part of who you are. Or did he say, hey, just pick up your, or just actually leave your mat right where it is and walk away. Walk away because that part of your life is behind you. I mean, all that stuff's really dramatic, right? But did Jesus say any of that? No. He said, pick up your mat and walk. For the first time in 38 years, he says, pick up your mat and walk. Now, why would Jesus do that? Now, later we find out that this healing actually occurred on the Sabbath day, and it was actually against the rules to carry your mat on the Sabbath because you're not supposed to do any like work. And so Maybe Jesus told him to pick up the mat and walk because he wanted to make a point to the teachers of the law. Maybe. And I, I think probably. But here's the thing. Like so many of the things that Jesus does, there's almost always layers of purpose behind why he asks us to do what he asks us to do. And so why else might Jesus have told him to take up his mat and walk? By the way, what do you think the guy did with the mat? What do you think he did with it? I mean, maybe he did throw it in the trash. 
Maybe as he walked out with his mat, he just left it at the entrance. He's like, Psh, I don't want anything to do with that anymore. Maybe he did burn it. I mean, we, we, listen, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. So listen, this is pure speculation on my part. I, I just want to be clear about that. <coughs> but as I tried to put myself in this guy's situation, like I wouldn't have done any of those things. What I would have done, I would have taken that mat home, <laughs> washed it, And then I would have nailed it to the wall and hung it up. So when people came over to the house and they're like, bro, why you got a mat on the wall? And I'm like, well, let me tell you what Jesus did. Right? And so here's your third point. I want to write this down. <coughs> Walk away with a trophy. Walk away with a trophy. Again, <coughs> this is all pure speculation, but in my opinion... I think it's likely that this guy probably did put the mat on the wall or somewhere else public where people could see it to commemorate what Jesus did in his life. I mean, look, the guy did something with the mat, right? I think he took it and he used it to represent his greatest disappointment and what God did during that disappointment. And he turned it into a trophy. So listen, you know what? I want to encourage you to do the very same thing. I want you to do the very same thing. Whatever disappointment you have faced in your past, I want you to find something. Find something that represents how Jesus worked in the middle of your disappointment. Now listen, you might not have even realized it was Jesus working at the time. You might not have even believed in Jesus at the time. But that doesn't matter. He was still working in your behalf. Because he loves you. So I want you to find something that represents what Jesus did and turn it into a trophy. And I'm telling you, like, this was revolutionary for me. As I, <coughs> as I was preparing for this message, um, I thought about my disappointment, you know, when I was told that I wasn't, you know, good enough to be a senior pastor of a church. And I was like, God, what, what could possibly be a trophy for me that represents what, how you worked in my disappointment? And then the Holy Spirit showed me. And here's, here it is. It's this book. It's called The Purpose Driven Church. Right about that same time all this stuff was going down, I read this book. And this book is all about how a guy named Rick Warren, who graduated from the same seminary I graduated from, how he, right after graduation, got into his car with his you know, brand new wife, drove to California to start a church. They didn't have any people, any money. Um, they didn't even have a name for this church, but they started it anyway. And it has now become one of the largest churches in America with more than 30,000 people attending every weekend. In California, for heaven's sake. Right? And so, and so I realized I was in a similar situation. Listen, Amy and I, we'd only been married in a year and a half. Like, we were fairly newly married. And God was asking us to leave where we were and go start a new church. And we didn't have any people. We didn't have any money. We didn't even have a name for this new venture. But we chose to start it anyway. And that's how Parkway Fellowship was born. And after 20 years, we have led to Jesus and baptized 1,909 people plus the people that got baptized today. Yeah. And right now at this moment, get this, there are 1,780 people committed to be in a small group to study God's word and to become more like Jesus. How cool is that? That's what God's done. It's, it's been wonderful. Look. I'm telling you, Jesus is moving in people's hearts. And, and, and listen, this book is my new trophy. And so I, have, I bought a little stand, and this now sits on a stand 
in my office. And so if anybody ever goes like, well, dude, why you got that book out? I'm like, well, let me tell you the story. <laughs> this is my new trophy. I'm telling you, God will do the same for you. Look, I, I don't know what disappointments you've experienced. Like, I don't know what really hard things you have been through, or maybe even what hard things you're going through when disappointments you're experiencing right now. But what I do know is if you will trust Jesus with all of your heart, he will work things out for his purposes. It might not work out like you expect, but it will work out. And when, whatever he does, what I want you to do is find a trophy that you can take away from that experience of what he did. So here's, here's what I want you to do this week. Here's what I want everybody, even those watching online, this is what I want you to do. I want you to think about your greatest disappointment, whatever that is. And I want you to ask God to show you something that reminds you of what he did for you in the middle of that disappointment. Something that you could turn into a trophy. Listen, again, you might not even realize it was Jesus working in your life at the time. I mean, I don't know. But find something that you could turn into a trophy. Because here's the deal. Don't leave your trophy behind. Don't just walk away from that experience. Don't burn up the opportunity to glorify God at what he did in your life. Find something that you can turn into a trophy because, listen, it will help you in the future when you're facing disappointment. So look back at that and go, if he did it once, he could do it again. And other people who are experiencing disappointment and they don't know what to do and they're at the end of the rope, you can go, hey, look, I've been there. Let me tell you the story. So find something that you can turn into a trophy. In fact, all this reminds me of the theme verse for our entire series. And I love this verse. Uh, the more I meditate on it, the better it gets. It's Exodus 14, 14. It says this. It says, the Lord will fight for you. <laughs> You need only to be still. This guy was laying on the edge of the pool. You don't get more still than that. But Jesus was fighting for him. In fact, here's the thing. He's been fighting for you since before you were born. Because before you were born, Jesus came to this earth to die on a cross for you. You, your sin has separated you from God. Your sin is what prevents you from going to heaven. Your sin is what prevents you from having a relationship with God while you're here on this earth. But Jesus, before you were born, chose to come to this earth, die on a cross, so that his death could purchase your forgiveness for everything you've ever done that's wrong. And if you would ask Jesus to come into your life to forgive you and commit to follow him, he'll forgive you for everything. And you'll get to go to heaven when you die, and you can have a relationship with him while you're here on this earth, and he will do amazing things in your life. Because he loves you so much. So listen, if you have never asked Jesus to come into your heart, I want you to do that today. There's a, a <clears throat> prayer that you can pray. It's in your message notes at the bottom. If you've never prayed that prayer before and you're ready to do it, I want you to pray it right now. You do that while I pray for all of us. Everybody, bow your head, close your eyes. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. <laughs> I, I even want to boldly pray thank you for disappointments. <laughs> Not because we enjoy dis being disappointed, but it gives us an opportunity to see you do something incredible. So help each one of us this week. Lord Jesus, to find something that could be a trophy, that could represent what you have done in our past because we put all our hope in you for the future. Thank you, Jesus. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.